everyone, and welcome to CGHE seminar 188, the 5060 webinar series. I'm Alice Wancha, I'm Professor of Philosophy of Education and Research Policy at the University of Oxford, uh, where I'm also leading the new Research on Research strand of the Centre for Global Higher Education. Today's um, CGHE webinar is on hegemony and inequality in global science, problems of the center periphery model. Um, this uh, particular topic is interesting um, from uh, the perspective of CGHE um, in, in many several ways. Um, in my own perspective, it's uh, very valuable as a link to the work that we are just beginning now, um, working on um, the role of research in academic life um, within and beyond universities um, in um, institutional, individual, national and more widely international contexts. Um, it also connects with ongoing work um, on um, um, inequalities and injustices um, in uh, the production and circulation distribution and access to knowledge. Um, and also with work that is um, ongoing on research assessment and how what the implications that it has for the dynamics of knowledge, uh, work in which um, I am privileged to um, share a team with Dr. Shin Shu and also James Robson and Gemma Derek. Uh, before I introduce the presenters for today, um, uh, there are some uh, brief housekeeping points to mention. Um, this webinar is being recorded and will be posted online on the CGHE website in due course. A transcript of the chat function conversation will also be posted. Please keep yourself muted unless you've been asked to speak or to ask a question. There's no need to have your video on during the webinar, but please do so when asking a question. We recommend using the speaker view so you can more clearly see who is talking. To ask a question, please use the chat function and write out the question you wish to ask. And then at the end of the presentation, if your question is selected, I'll invite you to ask it yourself directly. When invited to ask a question, please unmute yourself, switch on your video and state your name and where you are from. Today we'll be hearing from Simon Marginson and Shen Shu. Uh, Professor Marginson is well known um, to um, all of you um, through his um, extensive uh, publications on a full range of aspects of uh, higher education and also as the director of the Center for Global Higher Education. Um, Dr. Xin Xu um, is a research fellow at the Center for Global Higher Education um, and she specializes in, in um, a work on um, knowledge uh, production, knowledge dynamics, publication, and more widely research on research or meta research. Um, I am delighted to uh, welcome you both and I'm very much um, looking forward to your talk. Um, so I believe this will be a joint talk, um, Simon and Shin. So um, over to you for about 20 minutes, half an hour, after which we'll move to a conversation with the audience. Well, thank you very much, Alice, uh, for the introduction. And we'll just bring up the PowerPoint now. Here we are. Now, in the last three decades, basic science centered on universities and research institutes across the world has been transformed. In some, though not in all respects, science has become larger, more global, and much more networked, and more distributed and diverse across the world. It's less Euro-American centric than it used to be in relation to who spends money on science, and who produces science. Yet it's changed little in its language of use and in the formation of scientific agendas. It remains Euro-American centric, even monocultural in forms and contents. Now, since the internet began in 1990, world science has expanded with a network logic. Electronically mediated information and communication systems grow more rapidly than linear forms, extending towards every possible connection 
while intensifying relations between the existing nodes. Global science has evolved as a dynamic open communication system, autonomous and emerging organization in its own right. Between 2000 and 2018, papers in Scopus increased by 5% a year, meaning that recognized knowledge was doubling every 15 years. The proportion of papers with authors from more than one country grew from 2% in 1970 to 14% after 10 years of the internet in, in 2000, and then to 23% in 2018. There has also been a great growth in the number of science countries with their own infrastructure and engaged in the network. Science is no longer the monopoly of scientists in the Anglophone zone, Western Europe and Japan. In 30 years after 1987, the countries contributing 90% of papers in the bibliometric collections rose from 20 to 32. This includes many with below world average per capita incomes, such as Pakistan or Indonesia, Colombia. There's been especially dynamic growth of autonomous science in China and in middle-sized science systems such as South Korea, Iran, and Brazil. India has a per capita income of less than half of the world average, but it's now the third largest producer of science papers ahead of Germany and the UK. Of course, science is not wholly global in character. Science is ordered, regulated, funded, and housed in national science systems and in individual institutions such as universities and research institutes. This is the platform on which global science papers and network collaboration have developed. Science everywhere consists of two distinct and coupled systems, heterogeneous to each other, the global science system and national science systems. Now by global science, we mean the pool of globally recognized publications, nearly all in English, and the collegial networks, autonomous and regulated by professional scientific norms, in which knowledge circulates and scientists work together. The purpose of the global system is simply to produce and circulate knowledge. Scientists bring to bear on their work, individual and collective goals, cognitive cultures, knowledge, imagination, associations, beliefs, and habits. Studies of science discuss the motivations of collaboration, including cognitive accumulation itself, the drive to, to be, take part in cutting edge discovery, friendship, proximity, cultural affinity, shared values, and preferential attachment, which is the potential for status and career benefits through working with other scientists. Scientists are not necessarily bound by affiliation or nationality. They mobilize across countries and they move freely between disciplinary global science and their national institutional local settings. Often, but not always, the disciplinary loyalties are stronger than the locational ones. Now in contrast, a national science system is not only focused on science itself, but also on the prosperity and security of the nation. The two systems are different but they also provide conditions for each other. Nationally funded and organized people and infrastructure are essential to global scientific collaboration and output. At the same time, the growth of global science has driven the expansion of national investment in university research. Nations must keep up with developments in global science, but they and their scientists do not do so on an equal basis. Thank you, Simon. So following up with the discussions on the global sciences as a network, um, we argued that the network analysis as an open space misses some dark spots in the global science. Those include the connections not made, the conversations not heard, the values and knowledge is undervalued and agents outside the network. So in general, network the global science space has two characteristics, the structural inequalities and the cultural homogeneity. And there are two forms of inequality, 
namely the exclusion of knowledges in languages other than English and the expectation that universal global knowledge is framed by primarily Anglo-American cultural norms. So in terms of the language, English dominates global science and especially in the codified science systems in bibliometrics. Around 5% of the world's population speaks English as their first language. However, English is the sole global language of science as a result of 200 years of British American military, political, economic, and cultural primacy. And in the codified science indexes, English journals account for around 90% in the most influential databases like Scopus and Book of Science. And the low proportion of non-English journals is a result of selection and exclusion. It does not re reflect the actual publication volumes of those journals in other languages. This is evident in the example shown on the screen in the table in the comparison of the English medium and Chinese medium academic journals indexed by each databases. The dominance of English also demonstrates in other ways, such as the low citation rates for non-English publications, the um, unbalanced translation patterns, so almost half of our scholarly translations are from English to other languages. However, only 6% are from other languages back to English. All of these create language barriers for researchers whose first language are not English and as compared to their English speaking counterparts. Moreover, global science is also culturally configured. Euro-American or primarily Anglo-American organizations control the processes of knowledge formation, circulation, and codification. And this is shown in the country's concentration of resources, editors, um, intellectual property laws, and disciplinary standards. The homogeneity of language, norms, and knowledge is powerfully advanced by the leading Anglo-American universities. For instance, global university rankings embody various criteria. However, all of the criteria are grounded in the profiles of top US or UK universities, such as the papers in English dominate indexes, the number of Nobel Prize winners. In this way, Anglophone universities occupy the top positions on the world university rankings, and the rankings actually redefine, affirm, and recycle the Anglo-American control of science. Um, the cultural homogeneity is also reproduced in day-to-day -day institutional practices and the autonomous professional habits by scientists themselves. So scientists across the world are put towards the similar and familiar hierarchies and the dominance of certain research agenda, epistemological strands, the research paradigms and questions. Ministry and universities in some countries try to internationalize research, such as by incentivizing publications in internationally indexed journals. However, the internationalization is a double-edged sword. So the theories and methods must be reworked for Anglo-American templates and the local and national agendas are replaced by the so-called global topics and most of the time often localized to American society. The price of the cultural uniformity is the loss of a diverse pool of knowledge, including indigenous or endogenous knowledge. And at the moment, the multipl multiplicity, as mentioned by Simon, of the global science mean that countries like China, South Korea, India, and others have become better at doing Euro-Anglo sciences as benchmarked against those Euro-Anglo criteria. However, non-Anglo-American countries, systems and persons, they have much more agency than either the bibliometric evidence or the center periphery model will acknowledge. But in the codified science systems, the agency of this systems and persons are limited and they can only access their agency on someone else's terms. And there have been trenchant critiques on this uh, phenomena and especially from non-English speaking countries and also post-colonial countries. 
And critical scholars have adopted different positions. Some of them reject the existing sciences wholesale and asserting alternative knowledges as an act of decolonization. And some others don't intend to abolish the monocultural science, but argue for its dethrowing and supplementation by knowledges previously marginalized, invisible, and ignored. Many of the scholars want a broader exclusion of voices and localities, and common to all of those voices and discourses is a desire to advance subaltern agency. Thank you, Shen. Um, well, how then uh, are these manifestly unequal relations of power in science theorized? Well, in studies of science, the most influential idea of global relations is the center periphery model that was developed in world systems theory and primarily associated with the noted scholar Emmanuel Wallerstein, who died in 2019. Wallerstein sees all nations as becoming increasingly incorporated into an expanding Euro-American world system grounded in the capitalist world economy and based on a three-way division of labor between countries at the world center in the US, parts of Western Europe, perhaps Japan, which have strong states, nations on the periphery where states are endemically weak or non-existent. And in the third category, those in the intermediate semi-periphery such as China or Korea, Russia, Australia, parts of Europe. Now, countries in the periphery and the semi-periphery in world systems theory are locked into position. It's very difficult for them to move from one category to another. And Wallerstein says that this is because there's a limited political economic surplus at world level. He uses an analogy from the capitalist relation uh, wage wage earning capitalist relation and transfers that into the world system. So there's, there's a limited political economic surplus at world level and a zero sum competition between the countries in terms of power. Further, peripheral economies are captured by foreign capital, which blocks their further advance and development. Wallerstein repeatedly emphasizes that very few countries on the periphery and the semi-periphery can move up through their own efforts. This was a description of the world system based on 1950s, 1960s development theory when it perhaps looked more plausible than it now looks. At the same time, world systems theory sees the world solely consisting of nation states. I mean, there's no autonomous global relations that crisscross and combine nation states. So a global science system as such is impossible. An autonomous global science system is impossible. It must be controlled by one or another imperial power from the center. Yet at the same time, individual nations, especially outside the center, do not have autonomy. Only this rigid mosaic of nation states, the world system is an agent. As Wallerstein puts it bluntly, there is no such thing as national development. Now, Wallerstein wasn't a Eurocentrist by conviction. I mean, he, he started off as an Africanist. He was aware of the injustices of colonialism, but for him, the only way out of the problem was the abolition of global capitalism, the transition to socialism. Now this partly explains the wide take up of the center periphery model, because the idea of an, of an inevitably Eurocentric world is readily agreed by those who, unlike Wallerstein, welcome Euro-American domination, bask in the alleged cultural superiority of the nations at the center, and see capitalism as not just inevitable, but desirable. Quite happy to hear the message that the world system is inevitable. Now, the center periphery distinction is often referenced in studies of science, including social science and in higher education. For example, the work by Ladersdorf, Chinchilla Rodriguez and colleagues, Olechnika and colleagues, an important book 2019 on the global science system. Altback and others in higher education studies also refer to the center periphery model. Now, as noted, it sits comfortably with a Eurocentric perception of the world. 
also there is obviously a hierarchy in in science and in universities and wallerstein's three-tiered system seems to fit with the operating pragmatics of the world of research where stanford or oxford clearly are central institutions as, as olech nicker and colleagues see it emerging science countries are condemned to permanent subordination in their 2019 book they state core and periphery play complementary roles in the global system the core is the forefront of socioeconomic and technological development while the periphery provides cheap labor including cheap research labor in the case of science this is manifested by the fact that new ideas are generated predominantly in the center and then imitated in the periphery now they're absolutely right to say that science is unequal as shin explained but they overstate the problem and they lock it up they diminish the scope for agency and for change according to olechnika following wallerstein they state that individual countries rarely break the vicious cycle of lasting peripheralization arguably these analyses underestimate the scope for state strategies to develop science in emerging systems because like wallerstein they believe that all states outside the euro-american center will always be weak and subordinate now when science is explained in center periphery terms it is a poor guide to actual developments thank you simon so as discussed the relationship of power and the capability and agency in sciences are not as fixed as the world system theory suggests and world system theory underestimate the importance of national contexts and differences and the potential for nationally based agency to escape the so-called dependence trap and this is apparent when we look at what has happened in sciences since the theory emerged in the 1970s so in general we argue that the center periphery framework when used in the study of sciences negates the autonomy of global relations the autonomy and agency of nations and persons and also the potency of context and culture so more specifically the um, center periphery module when applied in science studies it doesn't fully explain the rapid growth of scientific papers and the network collaboration and the elements of flatness in the uh, scientific networks which has enabled the building of scientific initiatives in new and developing science countries also the center periphery model doesn't explain the explosive growth of science in many countries on the named periphery or semi-periphery and that the growth happened emerged simultaneously without exploration between each other and this is opposed to the zero-sum assumption as proposed by the center periphery model also the center periphery model doesn't explain the rapid development of links between different countries in the periphery and um, these links are direct they're not mitigated by the strongest science countries so in this network the countries do not act as gatekeepers also center periphery theory has no explanation for the rise of China and East Asia in science and India, which is now the third largest country of the world producing sciences after China and US. So the world is clearly not as Eurocentric as Wallerstein believes, especially in the distribution of our political economic strengths and the lying scientific capacity, and also in the distribution of outputs, where scientists in China now produce more papers than scientists in the US. At the individual level, the center periphery theory cannot adequately explain the motivations of scientists who have values in common and explain questions like why do they collaborate and why is the autonomous science network so robust and alive in the so-called centers, periphery and semi-peripheries. Finally, just as nations are knocked are not locked in by the Euro-American power. The scientists and their agency are not fully contained by their nations and the framing of peripheral status. So the center periphery theory underestimates the different agencies of both emerging countries and scientists themselves. 
Thanks, Shin. Um, so I think we have a, a more um, subtle and maybe more sensitive picture now emerging than that offered by world systems theory. I mean, world systems theory is right about the domination of Euro-American ideas in science. In that sense, yes, Euro-American centric system. But it's wrong to think that that domination is permanently fixed in place by global capitalism. There are two deep problems in world systems theory. I mean, first, it's a wholly economically determinist theory in which culture and knowledge and science are ultimately framed by the economic base. Second, the economic base is inevitably Euro-American and primarily American controlled. Now, history shows that neither assumption has, is correct. First, we have a new global political economy with the rise of the East and the import, growing importance of East-South relations, just as China-Africa nexus, for example. And also the strengthening of many middle countries and former periphery countries, not all, but many. And the growing post-colonial and decolonial momentum around the world. Second, global science is clearly not entirely shaped by either political economy or neo-imperial power. It has autonomy and more so when national governments build scientific capacity, which they want to have, but they do not fully control. Now this is hopeful in one sense, because it means that because of both nation building and because of the autonomy of science, we could have greater diversity in science and global knowledge. But at this point of time, that hope is not being fulfilled. Autonomous science is sustaining a global order in science that's more Anglo-American dominated in language, procedure, topics, agendas, than is the global political economy. Autonomous scientists in the network global system have closed out or diminished the potential of non-dominant emerging knowledges. Now we need a better understanding of the landscape than center periphery theory provides. And the question then is what theory might then enable a more insightful and more open understanding of relations of power in science? Well, no single body of theory is just sitting there on the shelf waiting for us to, to select it and adopt it. And we have to compose our interpretations and understandings from a range of views. But we find that the concept of hegemony offers a more comprehensive and flexible and, su and supple explanation of power and inequality in science than does center periphery theory. Hegemony also more directly specifies domination and subordination, while at the same time, there's less closure, less of a zero sum ontology. In, Gramsci's hegemon in Gramsci, hegemony refers to control by managing consent and participation. Gramsci emphasized the role of language and cultural mechanisms in systems of power. Now, although Gramsci focused on relations of class, this idea of hegemony, which he developed, has been more broadly applied in studies of power. Stephen Lukes, for example, discusses the mobilization of bias and control over institutional processes and agendas. Imanol Ordorica refers to the process of shaping and incorporating perceptions cognitions and preferences into a dominant ideology, remarking that institutions such as universities play a key role in the exercise and expression of hegemony in higher education and through higher education. These institutions sustain agencies and processes, for example, journal hierarchies, topic selection, which calibrate value in science on the basis of the dominant order grounded in the leading countries and universities. Now, these kinds of formulations, I think, help to explain the inside outside binary in global science. They also have a hints within them, I think, of counter hegemonic strategies. Thank you, Simon. And following up with the discussion on hegemony, we think that sciences, like most 
collective and common goods subject to unequal power relationships. However, the purpose of science is to build knowledge, not to build the systems of power. So the question remains as how to democratize and equalize science. At present, the global science mainly fosters unity, but downplays the recognition of differences. The next step is to move from the cultural homogeneity centered on the old previous world order to something like unity in diversity to work not with a stratified knowledge system, but with the system that recognizes and respects the fuller corpus of languages, theories, concepts, and methods. The ontology of a more diverse approach is well-defined. The idea of pluriversity, pluriversal knowledge, reoccur in the colonial literatures, focusing on the knowledge production open to epistemic diversity. And Santos proposes an equality of knowledges to replace the monoculture of global science. And he emphasized the interconnections between different knowledges without compromising their autonomy, and also the importance and the value of intercultural translations. So one step towards the epistemological diversity is maybe is to move from the sole reliance on global English to a multilingual publishing and translation regime. English would remain the shared language, but every effort should be made to reproduce the range of knowledge in diverse knowledge in diverse languages. For instance, all global leading journals and national leading journals and all the other journals will be available in at least the major languages such as Mandarin, Chinese, Spanish, Hindi, French, Arabic, uh, Russian, and some journals already do this. Developments in technology and also machine translation and machine learning could facilitate multilingual publishing. Translations would be made not just from English to other languages, but, also, but all languages to each other. Furthermore, the crucial agents are scientists, not the publishers. Uh, scientists, together with their collegial networks and perhaps universities and um, supportive governments could make changes. For instance, there have been initiatives like the Helsinki Initiative on Multilingualism in Scholarly Communication. And science will not move as a whole at the same time, but the path to structural multiplicity is through individual disciplines. New norms and expectations in one field can be the ripple that triggers the changes elsewhere. The multilingualism will be able to help extending the global common knowledge pool to the knowledges previously outside the English dominated academic world. In addition to that, and, and more importantly, much can be done on the cultural diversity of global science. The beauty of science is that it is self-regulating, it has autonomy. So the habits of scientists are much influential. It is true that scientists could reinforce structural injustice, but on the other hand, scientists could also transform the structural uh, injustice and with different professional habits. So each monocultural scientist that starts to work cross language device or draw on endogenous insights and knowledges, each editor who's curious about diverse papers and make judgments, not exclusively, but more constructively, and each cross-cultural group founded on the basis of equality and mutual respect, and each person who thinks about what the Eurocentrism means, and each person who abandons the locked imaginary of centers, peripheries, and all of these will make a difference. So when all the small steps and the ripples right together, the ecology of knowledges can really begin. And with this note, we'll end our presentation today. Here's the reference list and thank you for listening. We welcome your questions and comments. Thank you. Thank you very much, um, Shin, and thank you very much, Simon, for a 
um, a very thought-provoking uh, presentation. Um, I invite um, colleagues in the audience to post their um, questions and thoughts in the chat so that I can um, uh, subsequently invite them to ask them live. But I think I will um, kick off with a question of my own um, while um, colleagues are gathering their thoughts. Um, I'm fascinated by the idea of moving from hegemony to um, unity and diversity. Um, and I, I'd like to think through or hear more from you about um, um, how that can happen and whose agency um, is to be um, expressed um, through that process. Um, and in particular, you know, can a change like this happen whilst preserving um, the current workings of systems and structures for publishing, funding, peer review and ranking? Hmm. Yes, I was very thought provoking, of course, the, the basic strategic landscape we face, you know, how much, how much change is essential to achieve this, a real shift how much institutional change is essential to open up a different configuration of knowledge and a different approach. Uh, my feeling is that a lot is bubbling away already, um, particularly in various forms of publishing, the open access discussions, the different strands there. I mean, in all of that, we see the potential for greater diversity of offerings uh, and, um, and we're very fortunate to live in a period, I think, where um, a lot can become easily accessible and visible instantaneously. So there is scope, I think, to move forward a good way in terms of building more diverse approaches. But of course, the issue is how do you give value to or how do you give status to more diverse approaches? Um, and here, I think we need to work our way through a kind of binary or dualism which is sits at the center of this debate which says that if you want to depart from sole reliance on established codified knowledge you're in some way junking or rejecting that codified knowledge and i think it's really important to assert that what is currently done in science is of inestimable value and what we need to do is not to replace that with something manifestly weaker and, and, and less well resourced and less developed in some respects in terms of certain inquiries, but to supplement and enrich and ultimately diversify what we currently have with more, with more. So the question is, how do you create the space for the more and how do you create a positive sum um, cultural and institutional environment? I do think the leading institutions, the leading journals are all in a position to make a difference. They can take initiatives which open up things more broadly. And, to, and you see signs of that. I mean, look at the different ways in which, say, just to take one tiny part of the puzzle, the US-China problem in the United States at the moment in science, how MIT is keeping a more plural approach and Harvard is going closer to the American authorities and wanting to shut the door to Chinese interchange and engagement. Um, you know, you can see that there are strategic decisions being made all the time about diversity um, and, and the accumulation of those decisions at the top will make just as much difference as the accumulation of initiatives below. Shin, you might want to add. Thank you, Simon. I think that's um, already very comprehensive. So I think the changes of actions can come from different directions, from both the so-called top-down or macro level of the global regime and also the national levels and also institutions where higher education institutions have much autonomy. And also more importantly, from the researchers and individual levels as well. So they are also, I would like to not that the regime of, say, peer reviews or research um, evaluations are not uniformed. So different systems have different uh, approaches to that, and some are more diversified and some are more open. So perhaps by learning from each other and learning from the um, good practices, 
there could be more open communications and build the building of a positive sum on the global level. Um, thank you very much to you both. Um, there are already some um, related questions in, in the chat. Um, so one of them being, you know, over what anticipated time scale um, are we talking about? Um, um, but um, so I will um, pass that one uh, to you for the time being. Um, but I will ask um, Christina Holtgren to ask the first question live, please. Um, Hi, thank you so much for the fascinating talk, which I think is, raises some really important issues. Um, I was I was wondering whether you think, I mean, whether uh, adherents of the well systems theory would argue that, although I think you're right to point out that China and other countries may have agency, uh, they still have to compete or take part, participate on the terms of the centre. So. Basically, they have to publish in the same journals and accept the global global ranking systems and so on. Um, so I'm, I'm, yeah, I'm still grappling with the idea whether there actually is an alternative. And I think some of the the previous questioners, uh, or the person who asked the question previously, also raised a similar question. But is there really an alternative to this system? Uh, I mean, you're right. Of course. I mean, we made the argument that you just made. Really, that um um that the 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 emerged emerging countries the strong the now the newly strong science systems outside the euro-american bloc um are participating in science uh, and to some extent the world of universities on what you might call broadly western terms um i think we'll see a diminution of the um of the if you like the dependency effect here over time because that much agency uh allows you a good you know, in terms of political economy and, um, you know, real institutional strength allows you quite a lot of scope to develop your own pathway over time. Uh, you know, sort of Martin Jacques' argument about China is that political economic strength really matters. And, you know, having that, you know, when you, China gets to the stage of having the same GDP as the US in, in, in PPP terms, which it has, um, it's, it's in a position to develop uh, a lot of institutional structures the way it wants over time. And culture is more likely to come to the fore traditional culture, uh, modern traditional culture combinations um, will, uh, it will sustain a somewhat different worldview. Um, I, I'd also make the point that uh, we also need to, I think, accept the fact, unlike world systems theory, that uh, science is a distinct realm of its own, that you can't just simply read it in terms of global capitalism. Um, and, um, you know, both in terms of the, uh, the dominance of the West, Historically, but also in terms of the new autonomy of China, and 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 and, and other countries um, outside that Euro-American bloc. I mean, science has its own trajectory, and the cultures of scientists are really important. And on one hand, they're more global, um, perhaps, than political economy is. On the other hand, um, there's also potential for nationally distinct approaches as well. And in that respect, the Chinese decision um, early last year to cease to use the um, uh, the, the social science and, and science classification indices as a, as a primary indicator of value uh, for in academic uh, in life. You know, the global publication no longer being as important as it was in China in drive, as it was used to drive improvement. Um, the fact that there's been a de something of a decoupling there uh, is a first sign of the possibility that that part of the world at least might start to go its own way. Now, I'm sure that Iran in its, is also on its own distinctive path, uh, partly because of sanctions and the separation you know, of it from other countries, but it's a strong science system and it, it will have its own distinctive uh, approaches over time. And I think we will see Latin America becoming increasingly more, if you like, regionally minded in many respects as well. Um, Shin, I'm sorry if I've taken too much time, you might want to add to this. Oh, thank you, Simon, and thank you very much for the question, really important. Uh, I would like to add some evidence to the argument that the uh, countries outside the Euro America are making changes. So the changes may not happen overnight, just as the process of decolonization, it takes a long road, but it will, the changes will, are happening. So for instance, as Simon mentioned, the Chinese government has 
made the decision not to um, not to reward and not to cherish the publications in internationally indexed journals that much. And on the other hand, on the other side of the story is the emergence of the journals published by Chinese publishers edited by Chinese academics. And those journals are now having like growing internationally influence. So, and I'm sure this is not just happening in China, this is happening in emerging countries as well. So we're seeing these changes, but at perhaps a slow, a slow pace. Thank you very much, both. With your permission, I'm going to take two questions as a, as a block, because I think they are related. Um, and to me, they both point to diversity within the notion of um, knowledge production in Europe. So I'm going to ask um, Hane Tange first, Please turn on your camera and your microphone. Well, that's a microphone. I'm trying for the camera still. There we go. Thank you very much. Thank you for a very interesting talk. And as somebody from non-English speaking Europe, I'll have to represent that position. I was very pleased that you mentioned context because I think sometimes we forget context here. And I actually think it's important to be critical about the notion about one Euro America. We've done empirical research with international education, also looking at some of the research being produced in a country like Denmark. What we can see is there's very, very little European knowledge in any of our curricula. What we see is American knowledge, perhaps something from Britain, but Danish teachers rarely use knowledge from France or from Germany or from Austria. The idea of multilingualism is beautiful, but our modern languages are dying. I'm from a generation who learned four or five of them. I'm teaching students who may have learned English. So I think we need to be careful that we don't divide and rule here and use Euro America to force people like myself to read international education, which is what I specialize in, within a post-colonial framework. And this, indeed, I have been told to do by reviewers. I'm afraid post-colonialism may be relevant in the UK in the concept, I have no doubt about that. But I think imposing post-colonialism on somebody who's clearly working in a non-English speaking European context, well, that to me is also a hegemonic position. And then we fight amongst ourselves. And I think this is a problem. I also just briefly want to mention internal colonialism, as I call it. I think Bourdieu deserves credit here, because in fact, what happens in Denmark is not necessarily because British and American peer reviewers force Danes to write in English. This is something that the Danes, Danes choose for themselves. This is habitus. We did research on languages of PhD thesis. We can see something like 90% of all PhD thesis in Denmark are now written in English. And Copenhagen at Aarhus, the two big universities. Hmm. We see similar things for biometric assessment system for publishing. So there's something going on that is coming from inside, that is coming from our Danish system. And I'll stop there. Hmm. Yeah. Thank you very much. Um, is it all right to take one more question, Simon and, and Shin? So I'm going to ask um, Hongwei Gu to ask that question as well, please. Um, thank you, Alice. Uh, thank you, Sinsu and Simon for this insightful uh, presentation. I would like to ask, uh, did the regionalist paradigm deal with the variety of regional developments now underway in Europe adequately? Thank you. Yeah, great questions, aren't they? I mean, this mm -hmm. is uh, absolutely right, of course, uh, what Hannah says and, 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 and Hongwei raises as well about the importance of differences within Europe. And I mean, these are very rich differences and really beneficial to us, you know, the, the different perspectives between the Nordic or the French or the German, as well as the English speaking Southern Europe and so on. You know, really, you know, really important sensibilities uh, that are highlighted in different ways in different countries that all add substantially to our common understanding. Um, and I think that it's it's fair to say that um, um, that the non-English speaking parts of Western Europe, the rest of Europe as well, have really suffered because of the, within the Euro-American uh, world order, there's an Anglo-American world order, which in science and, and universities has been especially dominant. And to go back to Christina's point about ranking, I mean, it's been better down in the last 30 years by the ranking paradigm very forcefully. And 
the rank, if you go, especially if you look beyond AIWU and look at Times Higher and QS rankings, these are Anglo-American, um, pure and simple. I mean, they 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 foreground the 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 um, top American and, and UK universities as the model, and they force everyone else to comply to that if they're be, to be given ultimate value. And this has been as I think as hard in Europe as it's been in Asia and in Africa and elsewhere, except that at least the European universities in the West and north, Northwest of Europe have got the resources and facilities to, to play in the, 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 the sort of front rank science game. Um, so, so yes, these are big issues. And I think that fostering diversity of language and approach in Europe's really important, but I would make the point, this point, I think there's some hopeful signs here because it's not all one way, this development. And what the rise of China, Korea, you know, even Singapore with its brilliant achievements in science. Uh, and in another way, the other, the BRICS countries, the slow burn in Latin America, what the rise of these non-European, non-American countries is doing is it's creating space for more diversity everywhere. And this is one of the drivers of, I think, of the emphasis on decolonization and post-colonial sensibilities and, 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 and the anti-slavery movement throughout the world in the last two years. You know, it's the, the rise of the East that has helped to trigger a reduction in the hegemonic power of the Anglo-American bloc and opened the space for alternatives to emerge. And that will also help, I think, those alternatives to re-emerge in Europe as well. So the question then becomes, what kind of language framework, you know, at a global level is appropriate, I think, we are we we benefit from having a single global language, um, but we would benefit from having more than one major global language. Uh, and um, it may well be that in the longer term, we will see the development of not only English but also Spanish, possibly Chinese, uh, possibly even Arabic as major languages of interchange. Um, and now in that, I think. There's the potential for some European languages to re-emerge in importance. Um, I'd also, just to close, make the point that, you know, picking up a little what Hongwei said, that there are important regions within the region in Europe. And the Nordic region is, is a very significant block in terms of, um, um, of science and higher education. The cooperation is very advanced, a lot of common ground, common social philosophy, common approach to high quality equitable systems. And, um, you know, all part of that, I think that's a really important um, part of the mix and uh, a model which in many ways is a better model than the Anglo-American one in higher education and science. Thank you, Simon. And thank you for the questions. Uh, two quick points. So first of all, we are not arguing that science is um, kind of unity um, without differences within itself. So there are contextual differences, regional differences, linguistic uh, language differences, cultural differences, and also disciplinary differences, which we don't have time and space to explore in details and move, zoom in uh, for, this, for this study. But science itself is both diverse and there are some uniformed values and shared values. So this is the argument. And Another quick comment is that I echo the sentiment and comments made by um, Hannah about the internal colonization and this sense of this trend of self colonization is actually an evidence or proof of the cultural hegemony, which um, exerts the power not through like external, not only through external coercions, but also internal um, takeaways. Uh, from the um, powerful centers. Thank you very much, Jen and Simon. Um, there is actually a further question about the um, uh, definition of science in, in the accounts and the argument that you're providing. So hopefully we'll get to that question as well um, later on. But next, um, I'm going to ask um, Bala Subramaniam Chandra Mohan, please. Uh, please turn on your microphone. Unfortunately, we can't hear you. Oh, 
let's give it one more go. And if we can't hear you, um, maybe. No, we can't hear you, I'm afraid. So um, I'm going to ask you to see if you can, if you can um, uh, go through the controls and let me know in the chat if you feel that that's been resolved. So we will move for now to another question. I'm going to ask um, Ajia Habibi to ask the, the question about the, the structural conditions um, that would need to be in place. Thank you, Alice, and thank you, Simon and Xian, very much for your very thought-provoking presentation. Um, I think I was I was just really interested, Xin, what you mentioned about the habits of science, in which structural injustices can be transfor transformed by different professional practices or professional habits. Um, and so I. I was kind of just, I wanted to draw you out a little bit more on that, on those, that kind of micro level practice. Um, what do you think, what are the, some of the kind of cultural, social, um, philosophical, emotional, um, structural conditions that need to be in place for that transition to take place? Um, so from moving uh, between, you know, structural injustice to, um, professional habits which are more inclusive and um, in collaborative. Does that make sense? Thank you, Arja. Um, excellent question. And um, perhaps we don't have enough time to go into much details for every information about this question. But to respond quickly, the habits we talked are more in line with the habitus that uh, describe the culture that is shared within academic professions. And more specifically, we think that scientists and researchers are, of course, conditioned by systems and structural, by institutional national containers or the global science structures. However, there is room for agency. Um, you could argue that this is kind of a structured or contained agency, however, there's agency and there's room for agency. And in terms of the changes that can be made, they can start from very small steps. So as we argued in the presentation, even for everyone who's listening to the presentation today, if you could think about how the, uh, how the different cultures could emerge in global sciences, how you could integrate it, integrate or engage more with the native language of yourself if you're not Eng native English speaking researcher and how you could draw on the indigenous knowledge that you're more familiar with from your own context, that all of those could all be the small steps that are making the changes. Thank you very much, Sin. Thank you. Shall you make um, another attempt? I understand that your sound has been um, sorted yes. out. Okay. Can you hear me now? Yes, we can. Yes. Okay, fine. Yeah, sorry about that. Uh, my question is um, um, is uh, the um, the way the center periphery model has evolved in some ways. Uh, when it was originally proposed earlier, the power of the state, so to speak, the idea of a center and periphery, was predicated on the power of state of uh, particular regions. But now, with the rise of multinationals and them becoming more powerful than some of the states, uh, is science being uh, redefined in terms of the center, which is the multinationals which own the technology, uh, both in terms of uh, production, consumption, as well as dissemination, and the periphery, which I call the nation states and uh, the scientists. The nation states, and both of them have agency and structures within those structures, they're able to exercise some power. Now, for example, if you take the case of uh, the, the debate about the vaccine, uh, the corona vaccine in Europe, uh, whether it was owned by the company or the state or a collection of states or the scientists who produce them. So this basically, uh, in a way, necessitates a redefinition of the particular relationship in, uh, in, in global science. Thank you. Yeah, I mean, I think that, you know, that's. It an argument that says that MN multinational corporations are very powerful in the world is very persuasive. And I think we can point to a lot of evidence for that. But I've been looking at the whole problem of commercialization of universities really since I began my academic career. That was what I did my doctorate about. 
And, um, and I'm really struck by the fact that the um, autonomy of the research university sector is quite resilient um, in many respects. And uh, the autonomy of the science profession uh, as, or professions as well, surprisingly sustained through all of the, you know, the twists and turns of neoliberal reform and new public management and, and hyper performativity. And I mean, our, I think our job conditions in universities have been altered, but I don't see any fundamental subordination yet or subversion yet by the economic world. Um, even despite the fact that on some days, at least state officials would like to see us subordinated to the economy. Um, the, uh, I mean, this is not, and what's interesting is it's not only true of the strong science systems with their strong traditions. And I think the American tradition, the great strength is its autonomy, you know, in, in terms of intellectual life, it's fantastic. Uh, and that's one of the reasons why the global science system has developed in such an autonomous way, because US scientists, early adopters of the internet were right there at the beginning, structuring the global interchange in a way that reflected American values and practices. Um, and to some extent, that, that's just helping to sustain the fact that even in the so-called periphery countries, in the emerging systems, scientists, by operating directly into the international network, can sustain a good deal of autonomy in terms of their local position. And the constraint is usually finance, is usually funding. Um, and that's where national governments exercise their control. And there's a lot of research indicating the importance of that factor. But I would, I would say that, you know, Again, the constraint there is that nation states are not in a position to direct intellectual agendas. Um, intellectual agendas, by their nature, have to have some autonomy, and that creates a, a vital space. I do think that science, while it's at this point of time, reflects the dominant cultures, is capable of becoming a great force for good in this respect. And Already we see that in relation to gl global climate change issues, scientists worldwide are absolutely determined to sustain their intellectual agenda, independent of what companies might be telling them to do or what their nation states might prefer them to do. There's, there's a lot of resilience in that global cooperation. So I think you know, I th we should emphasize the autonomy of science rather than its subordination to the multinational corporations or states, because it is a great asset for us if it's working in the right way. Yes, I agree with you, but it's just that uh, that the instances such as this uh, raise this particular question of the relationship between uh, science per se and uh, the structures around that, including the multinationals. So that's why I thought it was uh, important to to look at this particular relationship between uh, science as, a, as an autonomous intellectual pursuit, um, uh, um, but at the same time, the, the external conditionalities under which it uh, sometimes has to operate. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, would you like to add anything, Shin, uh, in relation to this question? No, thank you. Um, so um, apologies to colleagues who have not been able to um, ask their questions live. I'd like to point out several really interesting questions from um, Lily Young around the role of national um, governments um, and um, around the coexistence of kind of two mindsets um, uh, within institutions and agencies. Um, and then a more conceptual question from David Law around the um, um, meaning of, of science um, as a, a central concept in your argument. Um, but I'm afraid time has run out. Um, it's been a really interesting discussion and very thought provoking uh, paper. So thank you very much, uh, Simon, and thank you very much, Shin, um, for your um, input today. Uh, thank you very much to, uh, to the audience for the great um, questions. Um, next, um, the next seminar is, um, um, well, two days ahead. So on Thursday, um, on um, Germany's dual pillars of uh, science production. So we look forward uh, to seeing you then. For now, have a good rest of the day or, or evening. Um, and we'll see you on Thursday. Thank you, Alice. Thank you. Thank you, Alice.